Okay, it's seven o'clock. Thanks everyone for tuning in tonight uh, in what's probably a smoky uh, Thursday in August for most of you. I uh, recognize that right now is summer holiday time. So for all of you that have taken the time out to attend and participate and ask questions, we really appreciate it. Uh, tonight's webinar, we've got Kate Nelson, uh, who's a wildlife health biologist with the BC Wildlife Health Program. Uh, the, this is uh, webinar number eight for the year, I guess, with August. The role of the webinars, our objective here is to help educate you and to have you pass the information on that you learn. Uh, I guess the, the big point here is if we just give it to the people who are listening, it doesn't do us a whole lot of good. But if you talk to your coworkers and your friends and relatives and neighbors and your MLAs and MPs about this, then we can drive change. So the format tonight will be very similar to the formats in the past. Presentation will probably be 40 to 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A. Uh, Josie will be monitoring Facebook Live, so she'll be sending the questions my way from Facebook Live, and then I'll be collecting the questions on Zoom. Uh, you can pose your questions in the Q&A function. Uh, we'll aggregate the questions, and then at the end of the presentation, uh, we'll put them to Kate for her answers. Uh, if there are any remaining questions after the webinar, we'll collect them and we'll send them to Kate, and she's kindly agreed to put responses together for us, and then we'll send those out via the uh, Facebook and also our uh, member e-update. So another thing that we always say, Kate is not a decision maker, or a policy maker, or an MLA or a minister. So those kind of questions, or if you feel like you're getting really upset about what you're hearing, uh, remember she's here to help and facilitate and talk about her program and what she's doing and what she intends to do. Um, she's not the person, I guess, that is in charge of how much money and what kind of legislation we have that supports uh, you know, food security in British Columbia. So that's the spiel. Uh, I'll read a quick bio and then we'll turn it over to Kate. So Kate Nelson is a wildlife health biologist with the BC Wildlife Health Program. She's uh, based out of Nanaimo on Vancouver Island. She obtained a bachelor and master degree of science from UBC. She's worked with the Wildlife Health Group since 2006 and has led the BC Chronic Wasting Program for the last 10 years. Her work with CWD includes coordinating regional and provincial working groups, connecting with academia and other researchers to stay informed on new science and sharing that information with partners and stakeholders. She works with other jurisdictions to learn about management strategies and overseeing surveillance for the disease here in BC. Kate is dedicated to building a collaborative team of informed and engaged partners for the best chance of protecting BC wildlife from this disease and other health issues. Uh, we definitely at the BCWF have a great working relationship with Kate. She's worked extensively with our members and clubs in the East Kootenays where we kind of expect um, CWD will show up if and when it does. Uh, so she's a great person. Keep that in mind when you're asking your questions. And uh, that's it for the intro. So I'll turn it over to Kate for probably 40 to 45 minutes and feel free folks to uh, ask your questions as they, as they pop into your mind in the Q&A. And Kate, if you'd like to share your screen, uh, over to you. Thank you, Jesse. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Great. Kate, we'll just get this uh, presentation up. Hopefully you can see that. So yes, thank you again for that introduction. Um, and thank you so much for the invitation, the opportunity to, to um, share the information that I have and talk about our program. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Um, it's, uh, it's great that we have these formats, virtual formats um, this year to continue to connect and, and engage. Um, so thanks again for the opportunity. Um, just a little overview. I know many of you are uh, well aware of chronic wasting disease, but I'm just going to cover um, some quick basics and a little background. And then we're, we'll get into some of the risks and um, prevention measures that we're um, working on in BC. Talk a little bit about our surveillance program and, and then get into uh, what a response might look like uh, if we did detect a CWD positive case in BC wildlife. Um, then we'll wrap up with some of our plans for this coming year. And, and I just wanna start off by saying that um, 
that your input is so incredibly vital to our, our program and the success of our program. And, you know, unfortunately, we can't be meeting face to face right now. So I've got my contact information up there. I'll, I'll be flashing that up throughout the presentation. So if you don't get a chance to ask me a question or provide input today, please uh, reach out because um, we're always really happy to hear from from folks and get um, feedback and, you know, constructive criticism and all of it. We, we really do want to hear from you. So um, please do contact us. All right, so chronic wasting disease uh, affects species of the deer family or cervids. In North America, um, this mainly affects deer in the wild, but we've seen it in, in these four species, both deer species, as well as um, fewer cases in elk and moose. Um, of course, it also affects farm cervids. And more recently, uh, it was detected in reindeer, red deer and moose in uh, parts of Scandinavia. The, Disease is um, just inherently very difficult to detect because it, um, in early introductions, a very few number of animals or a low prevalence, um, you know, few number of animals tend to be infected. And so they're very difficult to detect it in the environment. Um, and so it makes it very hard to contain and, and manage this disease. The concern is that you know, once the disease has established and we start to see it affecting a, a higher proportion of animals um, in these populations, we, we tend to see population declines. Uh, or we, we're very concerned about seeing population declines over time. But it doesn't just affect the wildlife or wildlife conservation. It also threatens um, hunting practices and hunting culture. Um, there's risks to food security and as well as wildlife related economies and, and different businesses that rely on the uh, healthy wildlife populations. Chronic wasting disease is a prion disease, so it is caused by an abnormal misfolded protein called a prion. And these prions don't function like normal proteins that would break down in the animal's body. So they accumulate, particularly in the brain tissue, and, and cause a neurological disease. Um, CWD is always fatal in, in every case, and there's still no treatment or vaccine. In animals that are infected with chronic wasting disease are sometimes called silent carriers. And this is because most of the animals that test positive for CWD look healthy. Um, the majority of animals that test positive are healthy looking hunter harvested animals we um, very rarely see sick animals in the wild. But even, uh, even though the animals don't look sick, uh, if they are infected, they continue to shed the infectious agent or the prion through their saliva and urine um, into the environment throughout the course of the disease. So, um, you know, these prions are accumulating in the environment before an animal even is outwardly showing symptoms of the disease. Um, these symptoms can take uh, 18 months or more to show, um, but in later stages, which we call the clinical stage, um, which usually only lasts a couple months, uh, we start to see these the classic symptoms of chronic wasting disease with extreme weight loss, poor coordination and trembling, um, sometimes frequent drinking and urination. Um, but yeah, the, the take home message here is that um, just because an animal looks healthy, um, we can't definitively say that it doesn't have chronic wasting disease. The image on the bottom left is an animal in a research facility. It'd be very unlikely to see an animal with these types of symptoms in the wild. And I I'm sure some of you are aware that this chronic wasting disease have, has been in the news lately um, relating to concerns around human health and potential transmission to people. So, I am not a human health expert, um, but I do uh, work with some of our partners with public health to try to navigate and address the, the concerns around human health and this disease. Um, and what uh, they tell us is that there's still no direct link um, to human transmission, um, and there's still no documented human case of chronic wasting disease. But there is some evidence um, and increasing evidence of potential transmission to non-human primates. 
Um, and although the research findings around primates are inconsistent, um, it is a concern. And so there was a, a, a report published just in June um, by the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute that summarizes um, our current knowledge of you know, potential human health risk. Uh, but essentially what public health experts are saying about chronic wasting disease is that there's still we, a lot that we don't know about these prion diseases, in particular chronic wasting disease. And so we can't defini definitively rule out uh, human transmission. So the recommendation, and it's a strong recommendation, is that positive animals should not be eaten. And this, of course, um, you know, raises concerns around um, food security issues. So, Next up is a bit of history on chronic wasting disease. Um, this is a map from the US Geological Survey, the National Wildlife Health Center. Um, the gray uh, squares there represent free ranging populations and the, the yellow, and you'll later see red dots are captive facilities or farms. So this uh, image that we're looking at right now is from the late 1990s. That was the current situation. But if we if we back up a little bit, the first documented case of uh, chronic wasting disease was in the 1960s in a, a captive population of, of cervids in Colorado, Wyoming. It, it actually, they didn't know what it was at that time, but it was later described as a prion disease in the 1970s and first detected in wildlife in the 1980s. So, you know, on the spectrum of of diseases and other diseases that we know a lot about, this is actually a very short window of time and that's why there's still a lot we don't know about chronic wasting disease. It was first introduced to Canada in 1996 through um, game farmed elk. And the next slide is gonna show us um, where we are current, um, our current situation. So, um, you know, not that long and quite extensive spread uh, of chronic wasting disease across North America, um, certainly uh, radiating from that, you know, the first detections in the Colorado, Wyoming area. And after that first introduction in the late 1990s into Canada, we've seen it spread um, through uh, captive cervid populations as well as the uh, free ranging population. So of course we're, um, paying particular attention to this area here. Um, you know, we've been watching the disease track across, uh, westward across Alberta for the last uh, number of years. And then of course, a more recent um, detection in Montana, um, first detection in Montana in 2017, and then in Northwest Montana and Libya area in 2019. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the recent data coming out of Montana and Alberta next. Um, this is a, an image of the, the statewide surveillance results from Montana, but really just gonna be focusing in in the Northwest corner there in that circle uh, around the Libby area, cause that is um, obviously very close to us and our Kootenai region. So in 2021, uh, they sampled an additional 800, um, Cervids, mainly uh, deer uh, around the Libby area, the like the, the center of Libby and surrounding area, and found an additional 40 positive cases. Um, to date, they've sampled uh, over 2,000 animals in that area. Um, that's over two years, with 91 positives in total, so a 4% prevalence, or 4% of those um, animals tested positive mainly white-tailed deer in this area. And um, possibly a, a good news is that the cases tend to be, or seem to be very clustered around Libby. So they don't seem to be very widespread. And if you can see like the red dots are the positive cases, the you know cream colored dots are all the animals that were tested, um, but came back negative. And so that is a, a, a bit of a good sign for BC that we haven't um, had any detections kind of between that concentrated Libby cluster and the BC border. But the, the prevalence certainly is very high in that Libby area. So it's, it's still a troubling situation. The 
data coming out of Alberta this year is um, pretty concerning. In this last uh, surveillance season, they had um, new detections of chronic waste and disease in 12 of their wildlife management units on the Western edge. So those are denoted by the red stars. And most concerning are in the management units 304, 305, and 310. Um, we are definitely seeing a westward expansion, uh, you know, continued westward expansion, um, you know, in spread across Alberta, but it's now coming up to the, the foothills area. So getting very, very close to our border. Uh, to date, um, since it was first detected in wildlife populations in 2005, 2006, in the eastern um, part of Alberta, uh, they're now seeing 50% prevalence in um, male, adult male mule deer. And that's, uh, so 50% of the animals that are tested are testing positive. In, in that area where the disease has been present the longest, but it, it really only has been 15 years since that first detection. Now this is, a, I have a note that it's a very different ecosystem than, than you know, what we have here in BC. So it's not to say that the disease would behave the same way. It's, it's gonna behave differently in different ecosystems, but this is what they're um, reporting in Alberta. They're also seeing evidence of decreasing buck age and fewer trophy bucks. Um, so, you know, focusing some harvest management um, strategies, targeting deer that are most likely to be infected, like those adult male mule deer. Um, we've also seen an uptick uh, of BC hunters that go to Alberta to hunt and return with um, uh, deer meat or elk meat that has they later find out has tested positive for CWD. So, so yeah, very concerning situation in Alberta right now. So for the BC situation, thankfully CWD has not yet been detected in BC, but um, you know, based on these cases and the neighboring jurisdictions, our risk, risk level has increased dramatically in recent years. Um, so our top priority remains um, prevention uh, and we are doing that by focusing on increasing awareness of risks, reducing those risks, and making sure that we detect the disease as soon as possible through our surveillance program. Our program is um, guided by a uh, surveillance and response plan for CWD in BC, which um, is basically you know, based on three pillars of prevention, surveillance, and response planning. And uh, important to note that um, you know, we're not, you know, BC is not writing the book on CWD. We are um, lucky that we have been able to learn from the experience uh, of other places, from, you know, research that is, is ongoing and there's more that we're learning all the time and, and also, you know, various management strategies that are being apply, applied in other places. So we're working very closely with, with experts and developing national and cross-jurisdictional strategies and, and recommendations that are, are guiding us here in BC. So next up, we'll talk a little bit about risk. Um, the CWD risk is ba really, it's based on a number of things, but um, mainly these kind of three things. Proximity of cases, that is determined by testing programs in other jurisdictions, jurisdictions like Alberta and Montana, um, as well the potential for importing. So this is related to human activity, um, you know, from places that have CWD. So this would be CWD prions that are imported in things like carcasses or, you know, deer parts or various products. The and if CWD was introduced to BC. Um, Density of animals is also a big risk factor. Um, if the disease is present, then when you have a high density population or aggregation of animals, we see um, increases in disease transmission rates. And so that's um, another real risk factor. So see, as I mentioned before, CWD prions are shed by an infected animal through their saliva, urine, feces. It can also be shed into the environment by an infected carcass. 
And so here are some ways that CWD could enter BC. One is infected live animals. And, you know, this wasn't really on our radar so much until a few years ago, but now that cases are getting so close, um, the positive cases are well within natural animal movement ranges. And so, you know, the chance of an infected animal just, you know, walking into, into BC is a real threat now. Um, infected carcasses and, and different parts of the carcass, which can contain CWD prions, uh, you know, those parts being brought back from, from CWD affected areas, uh, and also uh, contaminated materials such as plants that can contain, you know, the, the contaminated urine or, you know, different bodily fluids of, uh, you know, which can contain those prions or other products like, like scents that are um, derived from, from, you know, biological material like urine. Uh, and then lastly, I have scavengers up there. We, we know from research that certain scavengers like coyotes and crows are able to ingest these prions and they're not in, uh, affected or infected themselves, but they are able to spread um, the prions uh, around and, and introduce them to, to new areas. So um, the risks that we are really focusing on in terms of increasing awareness and, and reducing the risk, um, you know, relate to these human activities. So limiting risky activities um, that could bring these prions into the province, such as importing carcasses and contaminated materials, um, increasing awareness about, you know, the appropriate handling and disposal of those materials so they don't get into the environment. And also some, you know, um, discussion around other risky uh, activities like baiting or feeding that will um, encourage um, animals to aggregate and increase those concentrations where we start to see high levels of um, disease transmission. Um, once those prions are in the environment, they are incredibly tricky to deal with. They are resistant to disinfectants. Um, if you burn them, they remain infectious. They will remain infectious for several years, possibly decades. Um, and when they're in the environment, then they have the potential of, of spreading uh, to healthy um, servant populations. So once they're in the environment, it's, it's bad news. It's, it's one of the reasons that this, this disease is so tricky to manage. So we, we're trying to address these with um, you know, outreach and increasing awareness. We have a number of resources on our website, a couple examples on the left there. So um, you check those out. On to some of the things that we're doing uh, around prevention. So of course, we're, we're trying to reduce these risks and, and reduce the risk of CWD entering BC and becoming established in, in the um, surveyed populations. So we're focusing on increasing awareness around the risks and that's risky and material. Uh, we have some regulations and recommendations. We also um, you know, use disease surveillance as a tool to ensure that we can detect the disease early, um, as early as possible, at lowest possible prevalence. And then of course, response planning so that we can have a, a rapid coordinated uh, effort as soon as we uh, detect that first case. Um, so it, increasing the awareness of, of these risks, of course, a um, couple, other, couple other topics here. So proper disposal of the high risk material. Um, if these materials that contain CWD pr uh, prions enter the province, we were really trying to not prevent them from entering the environment. So things like CWD positive meat that has come back from Alberta, absolutely should be incinerated. It is um, really the, the, um, the best way to uh, deal with this type of material and one of the only ways to um, uh, deactivate the infectious potential of these prions. Um, other, other high risk materials, if there's carcass parts that have come in from out of the province or just carcasses or parts that have coming or that are coming out of our higher risk areas like in the East Kootenai, um, you know, really should be 
taken to a landfill and buried um, to, to ultimately reduce that risk of, of the, the prions entering the environment and exposing healthy animals. Limiting uh, aggregation of animals, um, which can create these hot spots. So things like feeding and baiting um, will increase the transmission rates. Um, so limiting those types of uh, activities um, that concentrate animals. And Im the import of, uh, of plant material like hay or feed, of course, these can uh, also create, um, can also contain CWD material. And uh, we really don't want those coming in from places that are affected from, uh, by CWD and contaminating our environment. Again, um, you know, once these prions get into the environment, um, whether it's by importing material or um, live animals or carcasses, you know, once it's in that in that environment, um, they're basically it's it's they're very almost impossible to deal with, and and so we're we're trying to avoid that. Another way that we are trying to strengthen our preventative. Um, measures is through regulations. So we have a number of regulations in place right now, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Um, there, you know, we don't uh, farm native cervid species in BC. Um, there's a ban on importing live cervids into BC. And then these last two under our, our wildlife act, um, our import of cervid carcasses from outside of BC and, and the use of cervid based scents. So I want to uh, talk about these regulations a little bit and these two regulations a little bit in, in more detail. So our carcass import regulation on the left there is, is basically verbatim what is um, written in the, in the regulation synopsis under possession and tr transportation. So this regulation was intended to target the high risk tissues. So what, how we define high-risk tissues are there certain tissues in, in the body that are known to contain higher concentrations of those prions. And that's things like um, the, the, the spinal column, the brain, internal organs, glands, things like that. Um, but in reality, um, any part of the carcass can contain these, these uh, CWD prions, and they could have the potential of getting into the environment. So um, we know that there's still carcasses or carcass parts that are coming into BC. Um, sometimes they're intact, sometimes they're just in portions, but we know that you know, part or all of these carcasses are uh, ending up in the environment and being disposed of, and that is creating um, you know, a, a risk that is just too high. Uh, we've had some cases of carcasses coming into the uh, province from Alberta, and they're transported to, to all regions. We had a number of cases on Vancouver Island with intact carcasses coming back from Alberta in the Thompson region and the Caribou region. And so, you know, that presents this like human import really does present a big risk um, because CWD could be introduced anywhere, really. And, um, you know, with our focus on the the Kootenai region right now, um, you know, it makes a, makes me nervous that um, this type of thing is happening, and we're we're we don't have a good eye, and we're not testing a lot of animals in other areas. So, so right now that risk is, um, I I believe, um, is too high. Uh, with regards to the the cervid scent regulation, uh, again uh, on the left there is what stated it in the. Uh, regulation synopsis. So um, basically, uh, you know, it's prohibited to, to use um, any part or derivative uh, of a cervid that's been sourced from another province. Um, this is based on the fact that we know that urine and blood can contain prions, but we don't have ways to test that material to make sure that it's totally safe. Um, some companies say that it's CWD certified, but, you know, the uh, it's questionable on how reliable that really is. Um, there have been some advances, advancements in testing of these types of material, but it's still, um, you know, pretty pretty based in research right now, and not a lot of practical application. So, um, 
So again, um, you know, I, I believe the risk is too high, but we know that that um, the use of, of these materials it has been really difficult to enforce and, and they're still being sold in BC. So what we're proposing, and this is just a proposal at this point, but um, you know, we're trying, we're trying to simplify these regulations, these two regulations, but also um, expand the restrictions a little bit to like further uh, tighten up our, our um, prevention of CWD uh, you know, material entering the province. So we're proposing um, a, a new regulation that combines the two and, and prohibits the possession of all servant parts that have originated from outside of BC with the exception of, of the deboned meat as well as the cleaned hide antlers and skull plate um, that have been you know, uh, treated in a manner that removes all, all tissue. So what we're trying to do here is really um, pro, you know, prohibit everything, uh, all parts other than the edible parts and processed parts so that we can limit the material that is going to be disposed. Because um, no matter what, whether it's bone or small bits and pieces, it could contain those prions. And we're really trying to do everything that we can to um, make sure that that doesn't get into the environment here. So if, if this regulation proposal does go ahead, it wouldn't be effective until um, next, next season, the 2022 season. Um, and, we, and we recognize that um, a regulation like this absolutely impacts hunters. It also impacts the vendors of some of you know, these scent products. And so, you know, like I said, our intention is to reduce the risk as much as possible, um, but we know that it impacts um, others. And so we'd really like your feedback on, you know, if this is the right way to go. So next, we'll talk a little bit about our surveillance program. Um, our objectives for surveillance in BC are to confirm and report uh, BC's CWD status, to detect the disease as early as possible so that we uh, have the best chance of preventing, preventing the disease from establishing in survey populations here, and to collect data that will help to inform a response plan so that we can have a rapid and more focused effort if we did detect um, CWD in BC. So we have a province-wide CWD testing on all cervid species. Um, we do have targeted surveillance in our highest risk areas, um, which right now are defined as the Kootenai region uh, as top, you know, top priority as also the Peace region. Um, where we've, we've applied some uh, en enhanced measures, um, including the mandatory submission of, of uh, deer heads for, for testing in the Kootenays, for example. Um, and some, some of this, uh, these enhanced measures and really focused um, effort has allowed us to achieve some really good detection limits in these areas. Um, a detection limit is basically our ability to detect the disease in at least one animal if the disease is present at a, at a given prevalence, but a, a lower prevalence. So the more samples that we test, the better detection limit, the higher confidence we have in our status. Um, and we can um, be uh, ensure that we can detect that disease at a low prevalence or a, no, a low percentage of animals affected. And that early detection gives us the ability to um, you know, respond um, more effectively, hopefully contain it before it, it's allowed to spread and really establish. So of course, um, we encourage uh, hunters to submit heads for testing. Um, we accept deer, elk, and moose, uh, any, of the, any of the cervid species, as long as they're over one year of age for testing. Um, the submission of, of harvested heads is encouraged, but it's, it's voluntary in most parts of the province, um, but uh, it's mandatory for deer in the, uh, in the, in the Kootenai region in our highest risk zone, which is in the, in the, um, along the uh, Montana border. 
Um, just a reminder that we do, or do not want the antlers. I know hunters will um, often call me and say, well, you know, I'd like to submit my head, but I, I, I want to keep the antlers. And, and just a reminder that we um, encourage you to remove the antlers either at the base of the antler or the skull plate. You can also now submit the lower jaw um, if you wanted to keep um, do a, a European mount. Um, this works for deer only, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so so we have um, uh, all the supplies that you need at the freezers and drop-off locations, and our website includes instructions um, with an up-to-date list on the freezer locations, and it's also where you would check for your results. So uh, you know, just to kind of go over some of the images I have on the on the uh, left here. Um, there's this great graphic that's up on the BC um, Wildlife Federation website that was produced by, uh, I think it was Mark Hall in the Kootenays that just kind of, um, out, you know, just illustrates the process really nicely. You just, you know, cut and tag, bag and drop off. Uh, there's ear tags um, at all of the locations. And this is really important that the ear tag is, is attached to um, the head that you're submitting. Um, one, we, we need a way to contact you if, if we ever had a, a positive case. And we ask at a minimum for a management unit because that is how we, um, we track our data and evaluate our surveillance effort. So I encourage, after you filled out the, the tag, I encourage people to just take a, a photo of the tag with, with most people have a camera in their pocket these days. And that um, CWD number in red there is how you look up your results online. Um, what we're collecting from these heads, uh, got a, a few graphics or a few uh, photos here. Um, Basically, we ask uh, hunters to submit the head because we're targeting the tissues at the back of the throat and for certain species, um, the base of the skull. So for, for deer species, we collect a lymph node, it's called the retropharyngeal lymph node at the back of the throat and the tonsils. For other species, elk, moose and caribou, we also collect that lymph node. But in addition to that, we collect a, a portion of the brainstem called the obex. And that is why um, the European mount doesn't work for the elk, moose, and caribou, because we actually need the base of the skull to collect that tissue. So if, if anyone is interested in learning how to collect um, their own um, CWD samples, um, please let us know. There, there are some great uh, instructional videos online, um, and we can also arrange for training. So if, um, you know, if there's a, a group or a club that's interested in, in, in learning how to do this, then um, we can arrange to have a little workshop or training session. So I'm sure many of you um, are aware of our results. Um, they were reported uh, several months ago, but just to to recap, here are our, our results from last season. So um, we had 1,318 samples submitted to the program. Of that, 1,185 uh, were suitable for testing. And the, the difference there was that we had, um, you know, so, sometimes heads come in that are under a year and we're not able to test those, um, but they could also have. Um, you know, some kind of a trauma that just made the, the tissues unsuitable. Um, but at, at the end of the day, we submitted 1185 and they all came back negative. Um, most of the samples, of course, were coming out of the target areas, um, mainly the Kootenai region, um, but uh, also uh, a good, good sample size out of the Peace region. And, you know, numbers were down overall compared to last year um, by about 120 samples, um, mainly down in the Kootenays actually. We had over a thousand samples submitted and tested in the Kootenays last year, but there was a bit of an uptick in the Peace and some other regions like the Thompson and Okanagan, we had a bit of an uptick in, in samples. So, um, you know, you can see from this map that based on our surveillance effort, we're doing, you know, 
great in the in the Kootenai region, and that's where we want our focus to be because that is the highest risk area. Um, but like I, I talked about a little bit before, you know, some of these other risk factors like importing carcasses into the province and transporting them into the Kootenai region, or rather the Caribou region or Vancouver Island, where we're not doing a lot of testing, that really, you know, exposes us to um, you know, there's a vulnerability there because we don't have a, a really good handle on the, the health status of the animals in other regions. So just something to be aware of. Uh, here's a breakdown of, of uh, the, the samples that we tested by species. So at the top, we have the species overall, um, BC numbers, mainly white-tailed deer. And there was about a 70-30 split male to female ratio. But when we broke it down to our target areas in the Kootenays and the Peace, you see again in the Kootenays, um, you know, obviously majority was white-tailed deer, but in the in the Peace region, we had a, a more even spread across the species, and um, you know, likely reflective of of the you know types of animals that are being harvested. Uh, in terms of where the samples are coming from, 87% of samples came from hunters. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, break down, you know, some other samples were roadkill samples. We are working with the trappers also to collect roadkill for us. Um, conservation officers submit any animals that they need to euthanize. Um, but, uh, but yeah, certainly um, hunters are, are pulling their weight. Um, the roadkill samples are something I want to talk a little bit about because they're actually a really important sample for us and it's we're having uh, trouble accessing roadkill samples. They're important because if an animal was sick on the landscape then they are more vulnerable to being hit by a car and, and so it's it's an important sample for us to be on top of and we know lots of uh, deer and different cervids um, do get hit by cars and then those animals are just disposed of, but we're having a hard time accessing them. So if you have any ideas or, um, you know, have an in with the highway crews, then we could really uh, use a, a, a bump in those, in those sample numbers. So overall from last year, our results, um, you know, we can't definitively say um, that there is no CWD in, in BC. Um, these results do not confirm the absence of the disease, but in areas where we have more samples, we absolutely have a higher confidence in the CWD status. Um, in other words, we're doing really great in the Kootenai region, and, and that's where we need, our focus needs to be right now. But, um, you know, there's some new information around risk and uh, particularly these new detections coming out of Southwest Alberta. Um, and it's leaving some areas vulnerable. Um, I'm gonna point out management unit 423 uh, because that's really the, um, which the area where um, it's quite close to these new detections in Alberta. And last year, we only tested about 5% of the animals that were harvested in that management unit. And so um, we, we need some more samples from that area. And that leads me to our uh, new expanded man mandatory zone. So this year, there's a new hunting license condition that is gonna apply to all resident and non-resident licenses for both deer species. Um, a mandatory submission of these harvested heads for testing. Um, so it's gonna include the four manage, or it's rather the seven management units from the last two years um, with the addition of 423. Um, this is consistent with the Animal Health Act general order that's been in place the last two years. Um, so the impact to hunters really hasn't changed, um, but it's now uh, being applied under uh, the hunting general hunting license condition. So some of the challenges we're still facing with surveillance, um, as I mentioned, CWD is ex extremely hard to detect because you know, in a, in a situation where it's a, an early introduction, we can see less than 1% of the animals infected. And so in order to de detect those animals, you need to test a lot, uh, a lot of heads. Um, and so our approach is you know, kind of what's most feasible. And so what we try and do is 
test access as many of the animals that are already being removed from the landscape. So har hunter harvested animals and road killed animals. And, and we would like to test as many of those as possible. Um, it's still really hard to access samples, especially roadkill. And of course, you know, I've mentioned a few times now that you know we have limited resources, so we need to prioritize in the high risk areas. Um, we can't be testing um, 900, 935 samples from every region. Uh, we just don't have the resources to do that. But um, but you know the more samples will give us better confidence. We've had some great successes over the last few years uh, that I just wanted to make note of. Um, incredible support from the hunting community and clubs across the province and communities. Um, BC Wildlife Federation donated uh, 10 freezers to our efforts in the Kootenai region a couple of years ago um, that really helped to well, it was critical in, in, in our efforts there when we needed when we needed more samples. Um, you know, the, the federation really came through. We've also had a number of, of clubs and other businesses across the province donate and offer to host freezers. And so that's been incredible. Um, you know, the highest concentration of freezers right now are in the Kootenays and the Peace region, but we're getting more and more on board in the Okanagan and on Vancouver Island. And so we're really appreciative of that. And um, we were able to access funding again to hire our regional CWD coordinators in the Peace and Kootenai region. So that's great. Um, the, the, the mandatory submission um, uh, order has, has been super successful and we were able to increase our sample size tenfold. So that's really helped to improve our confidence levels. And, um, and we're getting those good detection levels um, in the highest risk area in the Kootenai. So um, next, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our response planning and, and what it might look like if we detected CWD in the province. So the appropriate response um, is going to look really different depending on the location and the species of where uh, that first detection is. Um, uh, you know, a few isolated cases in the interior where we haven't been doing much surveillance uh, is going to look very different than if we see, uh, you know, cases moving um, into BC from, from Montana, where we're doing a lot of surveillance and, and have a lot of uh, information out of that area. Um, but in any case, the response uh, will be informed by our BC surveillance data and population data. Uh, it will be informed by other response plans and um, the expert advice um, that that we have access to. And we've also been doing some kind of practice runs, some tabletop exercises with uh, with um, staff and, and some key agency partners to uh, to kind of run through these scenarios and okay, what is it really going to look like? Um, uh, our our response will be based on evidence and the experience of experts um, uh, in other places that are dealing with this disease and have been dealing with this disease. And we're working really close with those experts. And, and so they're learning a lot and, and they will support us. Um, but the, the decisions, um, uh, the, the advisory committee and regional working group are, are going to be really integral to all the decisions, um, decision making, and um, together we're going to come up with the best uh, best plan for the situation that's presented in, in BC. Um, no matter what, we're going to need to act quickly and uh, in a coordinated way. So um, again, the, the response is going to look different depending on the situation, but there are some basic steps that we will follow and these steps are outlined in our uh, surveillance and response plan. Um, the, uh, the BC wildlife veterinarian will lead the, the response activities and response effort, um, but our, our BC CWD advisory committee, um, their input will be uh, integral to any decisions that are made. And of course, we have a number of partners and stakeholders on that committee, including BC Wildlife Federation. Um, 
the initial response phase, um, which will essentially be the first few weeks following that first detection, will really focus on confirming what species are affected, the distribution of affected animals and the, the disease prevalence. Um, we'll also be focusing on reducing transmission and spread and um, eradication. Uh, although um, the fact is that eradication is, is unlikely. Um, there's maybe one example in North America where the, the effort to eradicate disease following a detection was successful, um, you, you know, uh, but eradication is still going to be the goal. We're, that's still going to be what, what we're going to do. And we're going to do everything possible to contain it and prevent the disease from spreading to other areas. Uh, also note that um, our surveillance and response plan, if you're interested in looking at it, is available on our website. But we update the plan every three years. So right now, we are doing a, a pretty thorough update. Uh, of the plan and, and a lot of um, the updated information as related to response. So that's going to be coming out in the fall. So please feel free to check it out now, but know that there'll be a, a polished version um, coming out in a couple months. Okay, so some of the actions that um, will actually been, be taken um, uh, in this initial response phase. So they're going to be similar than that what um, similar to the actions that have been taken in other places following the first detection. Um, for example, what they what they did in the Libby area, the um, it would be run through an incident command system, which is basically an emergency response framework where there are specific uh, roles and actions and uh, a, a action plan for every 24 hour period. Um, we would define an initial response area similar to what they did in Libby. It's illustrated by that uh, image there. So this initial response area um, would look like a, a 10 kilometer radius from the index case. So similar to like a wildlife management unit um, in size and any of the um, actions uh, following in the initial response will be applied within that initial response area. So um, we would carry out some targeted sampling to answer the questions around species affected, distribution, prevalence, um, and depending on the population size, this might look like going and doing a targeted sampling of 100 deer within a management unit or, you know, within this uh, uh, initial response area. But if we have good surveillance data from that year, from that management unit, then we may need to, to you know, take out fewer animals to, um, you know, confirm or gather the information that we need if we've already accessed those samples from that area. Um, there Possibly, possibly going to be some targeted removals if hot spots or situations with high risk transmission are identified. And, um, and then, of course, we, we are going to want to prevent uh, any potential spread or further transmission. And that would um, look like possibly some carcass transport uh, restrictions and some disposal requirements within that. Um, initial response area. And we would be able to apply those emergency orders, likely under the Animal Health Act, immediately um, to, to try and restrict uh, movement um, and, and uh, um, yeah, movement of high-risk uh, materials, carcasses outside of that zone. So, some of the next steps would, um, you know, we would take all of the information that we've gathered, we would evaluate it and um, evaluate our, the ma any management actions if, if they're working, if they're being communicated properly, um, lots of communication and reporting to our partners and our, uh, uh, the public. And of course, come back and consult with our advisory committee and working groups to, um, to figure out some next steps. Now, after that initial response phase 
is complete and we have the information that we um, that we need about the situation, then we get into uh, more of a management of CWD. And these longer term management uh, strategies are not currently captured in our BC CWD plan, but they are excellent guidance documents like the ones on the left here from the uh, Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, AFWA and WAFWA. Um, these guidance documents, uh, we will we will draw from them. And you know, we're BC. Uh, we are watching and learning from other places that are going through this and the various management strategies that are being applied. Uh, it it may be too soon to know how effective these management strategies will be, um, but uh, these are currently the recommendation the recommended approaches to, to management. So um, the main one is through harvest management and targeting animals through hunter harvest that are, are most likely to be infected. Uh, again, it really depends on the situation, but in places like Alberta, it's the adult male mule deer. And so those are the animals that are being targeted through um, harvest management. Also looking at um, specific locations and timing where you would see increased transmission rates and, and you know, ga um, gauging your harvest management accordingly. Um, also a focus on disease focal points or these hotspot areas where there might be clustered cases or um, just high risk situations, high disease transmission, like an ur urban deer situation um, and focusing on, on removing those animals. And, uh, you know, of course, reducing uh, these artificial concentrations or aggregations of animals, where again, another opportunity for increased disease transmission and environmental contamination. So limiting attractants and, and different things that are bringing animals um, together aggregating. So um, we would work very closely with our advisory committee and all of our partners um, in, in this phase, in a, in a CWD management phase and figuring out um, you know, the, best, the best path forward for BC. But we'd have to move quickly. Um, you know, it's not gonna be easy. Uh, CWD is, is a super challenging thing and other jurisdictions are having a, a lot of struggle with this, um, but we have a really strong and informed team and a really good foundation of knowledge that we're gonna be able to draw from and, um, and so, you know, I, I take some comfort in that. So our plans for 2021, um, we're gonna assess some of this new information and we're always updating kind of our risk assessment and where we need to focus. We're working with uh, academic and regional partners and some research to investigate uh, animal movements and potential quarters, and looking at ways to predict potential entry points in, in, our, in our higher risk areas in the, in the Southeast, um, strengthening our preventative measures, tightening up our regulations, of course, always increasing awareness of risk through outreach and resources, um, continuing enhanced uh, testing in our target areas. So we have our, our CWD coordinators helping with that. Um, and just working with all of our partners to get ready for this season. Um, the last thing that we are still trying to do um, is, is build a uh, capacity for in-house testing, because we know that that's been a struggle. Um, we still have to send all of our samples to Saskatchewan, and so there's a delay in getting those results back. So, um, you know, we're really pushing for BC um, testing so we can uh, turn those around quicker. Almost done. Um, so I know all of you are already advocates for wildlife. You showed up tonight and you're learning and, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, but yeah, just, just encouraging, um, you know, to advocate for our program, um, support our surveillance. You know, if, if you have the opportunity through a business or a club to host a freezer um, or a shelter, build a shelter for one of our freezers, um, Absolutely, if you're able to submit your head for testing. Um, there's also a BC Wildlife Federation Hats for Heads initiative. Um, if you're not aware of that, then you know, talk to talk to the, the clubs or or the federation and, and find out more about that. Um, you know, help us to spread the word. 
you know, find and share resources. We've got lots on our website. Um, you know, share those through social media. Um, help us to hand out rack cards, whether it's, you know, at a club or a business or something like that. You know, um, if there's an opportunity to sponsor a workshop or a webinar like we're doing tonight, um, you know, all those things really help us out. So uh, I encourage you to, to think about that. Um, and last thing, I just, I want to acknowledge our um, massive team. We have so many incredible people working to support this program across the province and there's a long, long list there, but I just want to acknowledge that there's no way we could do it without everybody's support and help and, you know, just everything. So, so that's just been really amazing. And of course, I want to thank um, the, uh, the Federation, um, you know, for inviting me for this opportunity to share the information, um, particularly uh, hunters who are so, so vital um, to wildlife health surveillance. Um, it, without you, we wouldn't have samples. Um, and, uh, and, and hunting, you know, is, is proving to be one of the most important tools in managing CWD. So we're grateful for, for everything that you do. Um, and, uh, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, that's it for me. If there's time for questions, I'd love to answer questions. I've also included some links to some of the references that I talked about tonight, if anyone wants to seek those out. So thanks. Awesome. Thanks uh, so much, Kate. That was a great presentation. Uh, this is where things go kind of crazy because usually the questions start to flood in. Um, there were a number of questions at the beginning that I think you, you addressed through your presentation. Um, one was around predators uh, spreading CWD. I think you covered that and said that's a possibility. One was getting CWD from Alberta. You said yes. Um, one that was asked right out of the gate. So uh, this is a technical question is CWD directly, direct, directly related to BSC and um, JCD, I guess it is, or is it similar, just similar in nature? Great question. And I actually had, I had some information about that in, in the presentation that I took out because it was getting too long, but um, awesome question. So all of those um, mad cow disease or, or bovine sponge form encephalopathy, BSC, uh, is the prion disease um, uh, related to cattle. Uh, and CJD or creutzfeldt jakob disease, also a prion disease um, in, seen in humans. And so all of the diseases are uh, alike in that they're all part of the same family of diseases called um, uh, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies or prion diseases. Um, they're all caused by this abnormal protein but uh, they're very different. They, they don't tend to cross species. They have you know, the different um, characteristics of each disease. And so um, they are related in that they're all caused by the prion, but that's kind of where it ends. Thanks. Uh, now, one of the questions is how do you test for CWD? You kind of talked about what you require. Is there, are you able, do you want to dig a little bit deeper on that one? Sure. So. Um, there's still the gold standard for testing um, is by collecting those tissues that I talked about. So the lymph, uh, lymph nodes, tonsils, and a portion of the brainstem. And it's tested um, how we test it. We sent it to a lab in Saskatchewan and they um, basically look at the, those tissues under a microscope to determine visually if those prions are present. And that remains, um, the gold standard for, for testing um, of chronic waste and disease. There are some really exciting new advancements in testing that uh, involve some amplification techniques where you can we can start to see smaller concentrations of prions like earlier in the progression of the disease, um, but those are still only available like through research application. So for somebody like our program, um, we, we are not able to do that. So we still, you know, um, we still need those tissues. There's also some um, uh, anti-mortem or like t collecting of tissues on live animals. Um, again, there's been some advancements there, but the, the results are just not uh, reliable enough. 
So uh, all of our testing has to occur on um, deceased animals right now, but um, lots of work being done to advance those technologies. And so that might change. Okay, great. Uh, I do have a question. I'll, I'll tie this right into what you were talking about. Somebody asked about live ear tip testing. And so I think mm -hmm. you just dealt with that one. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything in terms of work on a vaccine that you can give us an update on? No, unfortunately not. There's definitely work ongoing to try and develop a, a vaccine, but as far as I know, there's there's nothing um, you know too promising. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then you talked about incineration for positive carcasses and, and a lot of carcasses coming from Alberta. Uh, is that on the regulatory agenda? Uh, are we able to make that law? Is that the plan? Well, right now we just we don't have a uh, capacity in BC to incinerate these carcasses. Um, right now we only have access to one incinerator at the agriculture lab in Abbotsford, and that's where we have to take all of our CWD positive meat that uh, we learn about that has come back to BC, and that's just not um, feasible. And there's a risk in transporting it. Like if I've got to go to you know halfway across the province to pick it up and transport that material to Alberta. So I'm in the process right now of applying for authorization to acquire our own incinerators. And um, it's, it's quite a lengthy process, but we're hoping in the next couple of years, we're gonna be able to be operating our own sort of um, you know, semi-portable incinerators in the highest risk areas so that we have that capacity moving forward as it's only just gonna increase. And then if we had a positive detection ever in BC, then we have that um, infrastructure in place. Okay, thanks. Uh, this one you kind of touched on, but uh, it, it has come up uh, quite a few times. Are there likely to be any regional plans for managing lower densities of deer uh, if and when there's a confirmed case of CWD? Um, you, I, I'm gonna defer to the regional biologists that know a lot more about the the populations um, in, in regions. Obviously, we're looking, we're working closely with them, um, but I, I really can't speak to that at this point. Um, yeah, when we talk about these high density population situations that are riskier, it's more about, you know, unnatural aggregation of animals than what we what, that we see naturally in BC. So, um, you know, it, it's going to be if there is anything, um, any management around that, I think it's going to be very, uh, very focused, very localized. Thank you. Uh, here's another one. Are is CWD, is it, can it be in antlers? Mm. Great question. Well, we know that the, the prions uh, can definitely be present in the antler velvet. And, uh, you know, probably in, in very small concentration in, in the bone itself. So it's a possibility. Okay. It, we, you know, if we, we get antlers coming back from Alberta, we, we treat it as high risk. Okay, that's because that ties into the question was related to uh, antler treats from pet stores and if they're tested and how that goes. So that's another one to add to your your world, I guess. That's a great question. And I don't I don't currently have a handle on where those are coming from. Okay, uh, would the enforcement of proposed regulatory changes fall under the conservation officer service or a different governing body? Uh, the new regulations that I talked about regarding the, um, you know, possession of servid parts would be under the Wildlife Act and therefore under the Conservation Officer Service. Thanks. Uh, one from uh, Central Vancouver Island. How can I get involved in taking samples and testing? Call me. Okay. <laughs> we have we have your contact number. Awesome. <laughs> Um, and I assume, so under this one, would you notify a hunter who submits a head that tests positive? 100%. That is our first call. How do ungulates get infected if there's no previous indications of presence? Can you repeat that? Uh, I think essentially the question is, if there, if there are no other animals that have CWD, mm -hmm. how do you end up with a CWD um, positive animal? Well, if I, if I understand that question um, correctly, I think the risk uh, is in that the prions can be present in the environment. Um, and so a healthy, if there's prions in the environment, whether that's soil, 
on the surface of plants and their food source and the water they're drinking, the prions could, could exist and be infectious in all of that environmental material and um, in the absence of sick animals, right? So they could just live in the environment for years and years. Uh, and so a healthy animal comes and somehow ingests those prions through eating the grass or drinking the water and that's how they would become infected. Okay, uh, so once introduced, is there no way to eradicate it presently? Um, you know, we're all, we, there's lots of efforts to try to eradicate it. And like I mentioned before, that will be our goal. Um, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of success stories out there is what, what we're observing from other places. Um, the one exception is the example from New York State where they detected um, a case in wildlife population spilled over from a, a farm. It was very isolated, like the, there wasn't CWD in that area or near to that area. And so they hit it hard and, and it looks like, you know, at least temporarily they were able to stamp it out. But it's, you know, all the other stories and lessons from across North America is that it's, it's nearly impossible once it's in the environment. Okay. Um, do you inspect salt licks to see if they contain CWD? Well, we don't have any way to test for prions in the environment. Um, so we don't, you know, same thing with hay coming in from Alberta, um, uh, you know, urine scents that are um, sold in BC that originate from deer farms, you know, somewhere else. Uh, we don't have a way to test that material right now. Um, again, hoping that there's going to be some advancements with these amplification techniques that can detect those small amounts of prions and, you know, down the road, there might be a practical application of those types of tests, and those tools, but um, we don't have the ability right now. Thanks. Uh, if you're able, here's another really technical one. What is the normal function of the protein before, hmm. it, it, before things go sideways? Great question. Um, so yeah, so there's like prions. Um, there's like prions or, or natural and normal functioning prions are part of all mammal, you know, bodies, cell function. Um, what they would normally do is, uh, if they were behaving normally, they would, uh, you know, serve their purpose, and then they break down into their component parts, and they kind of get recycled and form new proteins, and and there's this like balance of cycle. Um, but a, the abnormal pro, prion or the abnormal uh, protein is uh, misfolded in a way and we don't fully understand what it is, but it doesn't break down. And so they're produced. And when an abnormal protein comes in contact with a normal protein, it converts it. And then they just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate in the tissue and ultimately cause the tissue to die. And because they're accumulating in the brain, that's why we have these, this um, degenerative neurological result. Thanks, awesome answer. Uh, do you have access to all the animal disposal sites used by highways contractors for cleaning up a roadkill? I wish. Okay. okay. I also, I mean, I also don't have um, the capacity to attend all of them. But, um, but we hope to develop a partnership with highway contractors to, to centralize those uh, places where they deposit the, the carcasses. And so we can you know, create some efficiencies there and, and get some people on, on you know, boots on the ground to help us to collect those samples. Because you know, we know there are a lot of um, cervids that are getting hit on the, on the roads and just disposed of. And it's such a, such a missed opportunity. Um, where we could be testing those animals. So um, we're not going to be able to test all of them, but we, especially in our target areas, would like to be testing more of them. Perfect. And, and Modi has a huge budget as well, so they wouldn't even notice. <laughs> um, this one we've covered, but we'll ask it again. Do scavengers, can scavengers distribute CWD by dragging parts into other areas or by digesting these parts and through feces or dying themselves? Yeah, um, well, the first two, yes. So um, scavengers, and we know this through research, it hasn't been confirmed in, in a natural setting yet, but through research, they've confirmed that 
certain scavengers, so crows and coyotes, and I think actually also swine have the ability to, of course, they could drag infected carcasses around and spread it around that way, but they can also ingest the tissue, ingest those prions, and they, they don't become infected. They're just carriers of it. Um, but it, they, the prions remain infectious as they move the, through the um, you know, digestion and come out the other end infectious. So if that coyote is moving around the landscape, they are you know, depositing prions wherever they go. Okay, uh, good. So this is, a, this is a good one. Do you have any data on areas in the province with unnaturally high densities or focal areas of ungulates that you can start to address before CWD is detected? Uh, Cranbrook, Kimberly, East Unis, <laughs> Town Deer? <laughs> it's a great question and it's something that we obviously are talking to the regional biologists and um, our you know regional partners on on just you know highlighting some of those risks and you know sharing information about about those risks and, and coming up with some strategies all right thanks we'll have to collaborate on that after um how many people do you have working actively on this project in the province well, um, as far as as far as a dedicated um, person, that's me. Um, but again, I have lots of support. Uh, we, you know, our wildlife health program. Of course, we've got the um, uh, our new wildlife veterinarian uh, who gives a huge amount of support. Uh, other biologists that that work with us, um, you know, give their time. We've got the regional biologists and conservation officers that are there you know giving their time uh, as well so um and then of course we're able to contract our regional coordinators on a part-time basis um access funding through the together for wildlife strategy to hire them back again um but yeah permanent full-time people uh dedicated to this that's that's me uh, it's about 80 percent of my of my position is dedicated to cwd Okay, thanks. We're we're getting out of questions. I guess the question for you, uh, one for me, from all the people here. How? What's the best way? What What are three things that we can do to help you? <laughs> um, you can submit your head for testing. You can help us to increase awareness and get the word out. And you can provide feedback to us on what we're doing and what we could be doing better with current and also some of you know what we're proposing for for response actions as well that's three awesome thank you um <laughs> we've got one that is is a comment more than a question hopefully with heightened awareness and concern with cwd we'll see more resources put towards dealing with it uh we're behind you on that and agree uh, some promising research with excellent financial support getting underway in Colorado, and this needs to be dealt with seriously. Uh, we all agree. Um, and then another one that it talks about whitetail management appears to be key. Are there increased harvest quotas being used as a control measure in BC? For whitetails currently? Not, no, not, not that I'm aware of, but that's, um, again, I'll defer to regions on, on what, they're, what they're planning there. Perfect. Are our other, because you sit in on, on WAFWA, are other jurisdictions, now naturally these jurisdictions have way higher wildlife densities and especially whitetail densities, are they, is that a management strategy that they're actively pursuing? Um, well, well, again, every, you know, every situation, uh, every ecosystem is a little bit different and so different jurisdictions are going to be, um, you know, adapting to, to the situation that they're in. Um, but, uh, you know, as far as with WAFWA, um, there is consistent application of these uh, guidance documents that have de been developed, the AFWA document and, and the adaptive management document um, that I've got links to in the presentation. Um, you know, that is, uh, those strategies were developed uh, collaboratively with a lot of jurisdiction, jurisdictions and experts and, and they're being applied consistently um, in, in you know, uh, one way or another. And so um, it, we really are working together and, and, and building these kind of national strategies and, and cross, uh, cross border 
strategies so that we're all kind of working towards the same goal. But um, yeah, every, every ecosystem's a little different and you need to, to, to adapt. But, um, but yeah, no, there's, there's consensus that, that these are some good recommendations and that's what people are following. Okay, that's awesome. Thanks. Um, are there any videos on how to set prep ahead or send ahead in for testing and how to remove the lower jaw? Do we have those kind of resources? Yeah, they are. Um, we haven't developed any in um, BC, but actually it's something that we're working on right now with the Wafwa group is um, there was a, a, an ask recently to kind of pull those together. And so um, there are some great examples out there. Montana's got a good one. The um, Canadian, Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative has got a good one, um, but I can share those links with um, yourself, Jesse, and if, if you wanted to, um, sh you know, um, if you have a way to, to share those with others, they, yeah. they do exist. Um, we've been wanting to do our own in BC for a while, so maybe this is the year we'll do it in-house. Okay, that's awesome. So uh, I guess we'll leave it there. So I want to say thanks, Kate. Awesome presentation. A lot of great questions. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks to Brian and Josie, who have been providing technical support on Facebook Live and on Zoom and who have organized this. Our next webinar is September 28th. It's uh, Siobhan Darlington from UBC Okanagan, who's a PhD candidate. She'll be talking about the Southern BC Cougar Project which also ties into the Southern Tier Mule Deer Project. And uh, she's gonna have some really neat data and interesting findings. And I think um, even with all the fires that are going on, she's gonna have some really cool uh, data of where cougars are hanging out right now. So that's the next one. Uh, we're an hour and 20 minutes into it. So thank you so much, Kate. We really appreciate you taking your time, especially in the middle of summer to join us and educate us and inform us. And to everybody else that uh, attended, please take this to heart. Talk to your coworkers and your friends and your relatives and your neighbors and your elected officials about this. And if you're on social media, please share it so everyone else can have a look. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Have, have a good, a good night. night. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone.